Hey, what's up? So lately, I've been a little short on time in the studio as the parent of a five month old. What little time I can get in here, I've been spending just building short four to eight bar loops and just stacking layer upon layer of ideas and seeing what kind of sonics work together. And for me, that's the part I love of the creative process. The not so fun part is taking this initial spark and trying to figure out how to make it fit a two to four minute full length track. But over the last couple of years, I've been able to maintain a consistent monthly release schedule by following a specific workflow and today I want to go over that full hardware and software process by taking a simple dollless loop that I made in a live stream on the channel and turn it into a complete and release ready track and actually release it so if all goes right it'll be the song that you're hearing in the background right now and I'll have a link to the description if you want to check it out let's get into it This is a pretty simple track in terms of instruments. There's only eight tracks on the Diggy Tack that we can use. There's no MIDI on the other MIDI channels. So I just have a kick, snare, hi-hat, open hat, cowbell. I've got this bass that I sampled from the mini log. This piano, also this mini log sample, which was actually a full sample that I chopped up. It's this actually. Now we've got all these tracks laid out and it would be the same just like if you had tracks in a DAW vertically or if you were using the SP. So this will work in any format, but now we need to consider how do we want to structure them together. And so that all starts with how you sequence your intro. So there's a couple different ways to approach an intro. I'm gonna talk about three. The first one works with the other two as well and we'll use that for this track because I think it would work well. I took this main chord progression and I made this. And I think that would be the perfect way to start because it just kind of lays the foundation of everything that's gonna happen in this track. From there, you can start with the chord progression or you can start with the drums. So depending on the type of energy you wanna convey at the start of a song, you could start by building the drums up and then bring in the chords. So that's a much more high energy way, but I think what we're gonna do for this track is start, I'm just using the SP for the filter, but we're gonna automate it when we start sequencing, but start with the chord progression. Yeah, I really like the sound of that, but that's kind of two different ways depending on the energy. Setting it up, starting it with the chord progression kind of gives it a more nostalgic vibe in my opinion and just kind of sets the mood of like, this is the chord progression, this is what we're doing for the track. Whereas starting with the drums conveys energy and just gets it, okay, we're going, here we go. So that's kind of the two different ways I like to look at it. So when it comes to making a song, I like to just make one eight bar loop, four bar loop, whatever you want duration wise and build as many different melodies, sounds, sounds, drums on top of that one looped section. And from there, you can structure the track easily by just copy and pasting it. In this case, we'll just copy and paste the pattern multiple times, but in a DAW, you just copy and paste it horizontally. And then all you're gonna do is just remove sections and just add them every two bars or every four bars. Or I've got a couple different patterns. These are all the main, and then I have two of the B because we're gonna do something a little different with the B section. All I'm gonna do is just take the different sections and just use in the diggy tack temporary mutes or uh, per pattern mutes and just choose, I don't want the drums for this first one. I don't want anything but that main sound. And then I'm gonna go to pattern 12. And now for this one, we are going to want just the kick, snare and hi-hat. And then we're gonna use 15 as a sort of variation of the main pattern by just removing the main chords and the hi-hats. I typically do these dropouts where I remove the main part and keep the bass. That's a nice way to go. Once you've built up the chorus, switch to that. But we also have that B section that we're gonna try. So I like to have options. We're setting up options and then when we jam it out, we can kind of figure out which way we wanna do it. So now we're just gonna use pattern chaining to create the patterns. Now we need to record the track. And so there's a couple ways to do it, but what I'm gonna do is just play the sequence through into my DAW with the time and BPM synced so that in the DAW it will be linked. And if I wanna add things like other synths or MIDI or transition effects and things like that, I can do it in there. Now I could record effects with the SP404 
before just baked into the performance. And I already did that for the jam on the live stream. So I think what we're gonna do is just record the audio in clean into the DAW and then add effects with uh, automation and also maybe some MIDI and things like that in the DAW. So the sequencing and jam is done. I played everything through sequencing it on the DigiTac. If you do all of the sequencing and track creation in the DALA setup, it's a lot of fun to then move that jam however you wanna do it, whether all separate stems, which takes a little more time, or as we're gonna to do today, as just a stereo two track or maybe a couple of tracks, you get a lot more flexibility with how you can finish the song. So we're gonna add what I like to call ear candy, which really is just transition effects, maybe additional sounds if we need to add a synthesizer or something like that, all just to kind of help smooth over all of the transitions and changes between different parts. It's not necessary, but to me, this is what really makes the song flow and it gives it the proper pacing of what I would call like a professional sounding track. So I just grabbed a couple, just for the sake of this video, quickly Apple loops, which come with logic, all these kinds of different noises. Let's just play some of them. A lot of just crazy sounds. That's a snare. That would be good to kind of really transition. That's a trippy one. You can even reverse some of these sounds. You can make sounds of your own. White noise is a lot of fun to do as well. This pulse, which is off time, I think, but that should be really good for the big climax, the big crescendo of the track. A lot of house music and stuff like that uses it. And I like to use it in my other tracks because it just gives this sort of movement like oh the track is going now it's pumping or something like that and let me just play you the track i have that long intro at the start which we may not even keep just thinking about pacing it might be too long of an intro here's the drums all that type of stuff in sequencing we already covered horizontal elements of a track which really is just when you're writing think about increments of two and always start to add new layers every couple of bars. So every two, four, eight bars, you always wanna be adding in melodies or even automating melodies to come up before that second or fourth bar. That's all horizontal. So it's once it starts, it's gonna keep playing or at least keep playing for a while. There's also what we're gonna do right now, which is what I like to call vertical elements. So all of these one shot sounds, you can take a small segment to use as a transition at the end of one segment, or you can take the end of one segment, reverse it, mangle it up, something like that that to really introduce the ear to what's coming. Say, hey, something's changing, and then it happens. So let's just start throwing in some sounds and see what we get. So I can already tell I want to add a filter at the start of this, so I'm gonna go into my plugins, and I really like the MS-20 filter. So let's just play it through and see what it would sound like. Yeah, that's perfect. Okay, so I'm just going to go and automate that. So let's go into automation and we're gonna find that filter and we're going to go to, should be LPF cutoff frequency and it will start at, I guess, seven. There it is. Here we go. Okay, so the song's going. I'm just gonna play it through and kind of get a feel for where I want transitions. Right there, I need something right where that bass is gonna start. Can actually add the uh, epic snare. So I'm gonna make a new track so I can move these in just to have space. And this is where having it BPM synced comes in really handy because now I can have that snare hit right where I want it. And that's really loud, so let's go. And we could even take this little falling sound and put it right beforehand, see what that sounds like. Not that one. We need some kind of like air sound. See what other options we have. Maybe we do that one and we can like reverse it or something. And I think it's shift R. Shift control R. I always forget what it is. All right, let's see what that sounds like. Perfect. So we'll do volume and stuff later, but as you can see, I really wanted when the bass is about to start. Yeah, you could just have the bass start at that, but lead into it. Give the ear a little tease of something, like something's happening. So that's what we'll do. We'll raise the snare up a little bit louder, so. There we go. 
I'm going to just show a couple more of these because I don't want you to have to sit through listening to this whole song meticulously, but I'll show one or two and I'll cut through them. But I will put up this full unedited version for channel members. So if you want to see how I go through and inspect all these different transitions, you can check out the channel members. If you like this type of content and want to see more or to help the channel and do more of this type of stuff, consider joining the membership. You also get sample packs every month and a bunch of other stuff. So be great to see you over there. Okay, this is the next big transition where there's actually a dropout. So let's see what kind of sounds we have. That one, that slowed down sound, that should be perfect to kind of introduce something's happening. On the SP, it's really easy to also add some really cool effects on top of stuff. I might do that too, but I'm thinking more pacing wise. I want those transitions to hit a little harder and you could do that by triggering one shots on the SP as the sequence is playing or have that programmed with the MIDI on the DigiTac into the SP. There's all kinds of options. So this isn't a DAW is better than DAWless or anything like that. I just like having the ability to see it all and do it kind of more meticulously by like methodically going through each segment it takes a lot of time, but it's something to consider. And then I think I will add some effects. Some of these transitions will do as effects, but I just, I like these noise transitions, they're fun. Yeah, that should work. I'm just figuring out where I want it. So we could either have it right there or we could put it right here. there's a kind of second of silence, which is impactful. Silence in music and in transitions can really do a lot, but I kind of like where it's still going at the start. And I think I'm actually gonna make this a separate one because I'm gonna do some effect automation on this part actually. So let's go here and I'm gonna add some super massive, which will add a lot of really cool reverb to this sound. I just want a really easy delay, tape delay. Let's do that, get some feedback. We'll have it abruptly stop when that snare hits. Let's see what that sounds like. Little too late. Oh, we could have just zoomed in because it's tempo synced, but that's okay. Do it the hard way, I guess, to start. and we'll just lower that. It doesn't need to be that loud. The lower it is, the less perfect the end and all that type of stuff need to be. It's, it's not, it doesn't need to be loud. It doesn't need to be persistent. It doesn't need to be very present. All it needs to be is there psychoacoustically to just kind of tease the ear. I'm gonna just do one more where I add some effects to the actual track part. Right there, I want to add some reverb. So I'm gonna put, again, super massive. This is a free plugin, by the way. No sponsorship or anything like that, but there's so much flexibility with this plugin and it's free, so it doesn't hurt grabbing it. I like that it has an EQ because I can cut out all the low end and clean up the mud and things like that. So we'll do that and we're gonna just automate to super massive, go to the mix. Perfect. And then right before those drums come in. Oh, I really like that ring out though. I know what we'll do. I really like that snare sound ringing. So what we're actually gonna do is chop this part right there, right at that start of the kick. We might have to do a little filtering, but then we're gonna duplicate this, move this here, and we will shut off the Supermassive so it doesn't matter how we automate it. And then we'll just mute this. Let's see what that sounds like, because I really want that snare to ring out. It sounded so good. And almost as like I was saying, a transition in its own right, like you could do with Kodama or SX Reverb on the SP. So let's hear what that sounds like. There it is. That's perfect. So I'm gonna just add some more transitions and things like that. And I don't think this song necessarily needs any additional tracks, but if you wanted to, using this method, you could just go add a software instrument. Let's just add a retro synth. And I'm not actually sure what key this song was in, I forget. But uh, let's just say we want a synth in this section. What key was this song in? I wanna say it was, I have no idea. Let's just do E for right now. Hold this. 
Let's get a better sounding synth. At least let's just add some of that. Get some attack along that. Okay, let's see if E's right. This could be horribly wrong. <laughs> it is. <laughs> let's see. But that's not. So I was close. E flat will work. I'm just going to add the felt piano. And let's see what that sounds like. But anyways, this is what you would do. You would add a couple of instruments if you wanted to. It's all tempo synced, so you can't go wrong. Yeah, that's good. And let's add some bassier note. That should work. And let's just duplicate it. And then let's also, can never go wrong with uh, super massive, but first I'm gonna warp this because everything on the Dollis setup had a lot of grit to it. So I'm gonna grit this one up a little bit with uh, tape mellow fi, have a filter a little bit, and then let's add super massive. It's my go-to for drones, for ambient, or just for background reverb. And we're gonna just put this quiet in the background. And on this one, let's go up a bit. Let's try C. That's perfect. If you want to add instruments, that's really the power of this hybrid setup we're doing. Syncing the tempo is the key here. I'm gonna add all these other transitions. Okay, so the song is done and I couldn't help myself. I did end up adding a bunch of MIDI. <laughs> <laughs> That's my problem with working in a DAW. I'm just a maximalist. I just keep adding and adding. Luckily, since this is a video that I'm making, I stop myself just due to time because I just keep adding and adding. And at a certain point, it's good to just end, especially if you're trying to release tracks like we're doing in this uh, video today. I just get bogged down. And then the more you add, the more you have to worry about mixing and all that type of stuff. So let me just explain what I added just if you're looking to add things and stuff like that. First of all, I thought that the original performance needed a little more of that final chorus, crescendo, whatever you want to call it. So because we're working in the right BPM, I just chopped this segment right here and then uh, added it, uh, duplicated it, and then just moved that final part just a couple bars over. And then to get that last double of the chorus, I added the piano back and then also some synths. And then I added some percussion. Because what I really like is Logic has, I don't know if you'd call it a generative drummer, whatever you want to call it, but you can say, hey, I want this type of drums and this complexity, this volume, dynamic, all that type of stuff. And it just generates something. So it's all about just adding little ear candy, right? So this is another great ear candy trick. And then I made a hi-hat, but it was too slow. So I just sped it up by just moving the track here. And then I just chopped it around a little bit more. So just experiment with all kinds of things is really what I'm trying to say. If you feel like something's missing in a part, do it this way and just add more. Because if I would have stuck to the Dala setup, I would have had to have redone the whole part and figured out what I wanted to add here. I could just experiment and be like, oh, I like that piano. Why don't I make that piano MIDI a synth and then drop it an octave? Oh, and then I can pan one left, pan one right, and then we get some stereo work, all that type of stuff. So use a workflow that works best for you. I like this hybrid sort of workflow, but again, I spent like 30 or 40 more minutes with what I thought was a finished track adding stuff. But now let's move over to mastering. Let me know in the comments if you've ever listened to your songs once you put them on Spotify and felt like they were way quieter than everyone else's. Because mastering is really what's gonna help you get there to not feel that way. You'll be competitive in terms of the volumes and things like that. This is not a comprehensive guide to mastering. There's a lot to learn about mastering. There's all kinds of stuff. I'm not gonna go over all of the aspects when it comes to compression, when it comes to limiting. I just wanna show you a quick start that you can implement and really get your tracks to sound higher in volume and all that type of stuff. So the first thing we're gonna need is a clipper. And so a clipper is used to control and shape peaks. And there's a lot of nuance that you can get with that. I'm gonna use a clipper that was sent to me recently from Schwab Digital. And this thing, Gold Clip, is a lot more than just a clipper. And I'll be posting some shorts with a couple other things. They sent this over, but they have no say in the video. This isn't sponsored. They just sent it over for me to check out. I'm really impressed with what it can do. So one thing I really like about this plugin specifically and the company is they send you 
you a couple different emails that aren't spammy, but just explaining every aspect of what Gold Clip does. And they also, the first email that they send is a quick start guide for if you want it to just do what it's supposed to quickly go get one db of clipping which you'll see here in this clipping section and then you want to add just a little bit of the gold clip and a little bit of this alchemy if you want to learn all kinds of stuff about what the gold is doing and what the alchemy is doing and all of these different clippers and things like that i would highly recommend checking out their website the link is in the description and they also offer a free 30-day trial for the plugin so you can check out whether you like it or not if it works for you i've been using it on every master i've been doing for my record label and i was actually really bummed because i got this after I released my music for Imagine Landscapes album and I was like, I would have put this on every track, but that's okay. The next album and this song has it, so it's all good. So I'm gonna do what they recommend in that first email and just get one dB of clipping or around one dB of clipping and then a little gold and a little alchemy and then we'll play what it does. Now, granted, a lot of what it's doing is, is maximizing the volume, it's bringing up the volume. So if you wanna look at Unity and comparisons, you can mess with the dry wet, you can turn on the Unity to see, but if you really wanna learn all that type of stuff, I would recommend researching what gain, staging, all that type of stuff is. The louder you make something, the more pleasing it's gonna to sound to your ears. So if we're making something louder with gold clip, with a limiter or anything like that, just by default, it will sound better, but that doesn't mean it's actually doing anything anything so keep that in mind in this case it is doing some really cool stuff and if you want to test out really how it's doing it test the unity test the dry wet all that type of stuff see make a comparison gain you know oh, if the gains here that's not what this video is about if you want to see a video explaining all that type of stuff let me know in the comments and I can make one but I just want to make this song sound good so that's what I'm gonna do so we're gonna start playing we're gonna find the loudest part of the track. I'm gonna just assume because there's so much happening in this final segment, this is the loudest part. And you could even check just by your meter right here or put a multimeter, which we'll do actually, because we're gonna to wanna to see all kinds of different metrics. We're going to want to see where everything is. Here's metering, sorry. I can't talk and find this at the same time, but we wanna see where everything is. So we wanna see the luffs, we wanna see the frequency spectrum, and we wanna see the peak. Now we've got it playing, so now we can start adding some stuff so let's get gold clip on so we want 1 db of clipping in this loudest part so that's 1.6 that's okay let's shut off gold and alchemy to start and you can hear the low end transients have changed a little bit as well as the high gold handles the low and the alchemy handles high shaping and things like that so we're getting about 1 db we'll do it there and then we're going to bring up gold Let's max it and see what it does. You can hear the kick gets a little more distorted and it's a, the transient is definitely changed a little bit, but let's do a lot less because they recommend just like 25%. And here is Alchemy. Listen to the high end. It's changing around a little bit. It's being a little more, it's tamed a little bit, and that's what the alchemy does. So I'm just gonna shape that down there. This is it without it. This is it with it, I'm gonna up. Hear that kick getting a little saturated and things like that? We upped the, the clipping quite a bit. So I'm gonna bring that clipping back down. We don't need that much. Just want a little bit. And you could mess with the type of clippers and the type of gold. I really like that. Listen to the wet and dry. Now, of course, it is quiet. Let's just quickly test Unity Gain. So listen to the snare and the kick specifically. The snare for what Alchemy is doing and the kick for what gold is doing. It's bringing everything a little tighter together, but it's also getting us a lot of uh, perceived loudness without actually altering the meter all that much. Here when we shut Unity off, it is definitely making it louder. So let's look at the peak here. So we're hitting 2.7 at that start of it. Now let's turn gold on. We actually lowered the peak thanks to the clipper. That's what any clipper will do, which means we can push and really drive this track to be a lot louder. So again, if you're struggling with tracks not being loud enough, any clipper can do this sort of thing. It's just 
bring down those peaks so when the highest parts are hitting and hit negative one, let's say, or whatever number, negative two in this case, if you're controlling those peaks and dropping them down with a transient shaper or a clipper, like gold clip, you get more room so you can push everything up in volume and all the other stuff that gold clip is doing is helping to control those peaks. It's doing that with the low end and it's doing it with the high end and so we get a lot more that we can push. Okay, so the next one is less about volume and more about shaping the sounds. So it's just an EQ. Now I'm using headphones right now. The final version, I'm not gonna use headphones because these have a very low high-end response. There's not a lot of high-end in these headphones. So when it comes to hi-hats or any sounds that are in the high range, this is gonna mask it and color it. So I'm not gonna use these when I finally master it, but I have to for the video. If it sounds a little different than what I'm hearing to you, that's probably why, if the high-end sounds different. But all I'm looking for is muddy areas in this area, like 150 to 250. I'm gonna just do an insane amount to show you and let me raise it. Hear all that mud? That's taking up space. Now, if you like the way it sounds, that's great. I just like to do a gentle EQ cut. Just get a little bit out of there. And then sometimes you can find resonance peaks. Let me just do for an example. This might get a little gnarly sounding. Hear that resonance peak? If you wanted to, you could cut those out. It's better to do that per track. Now you can't do that with the Dawless thing, but if you have additional sounds you've added or if you're working in a DAW, do that. Or just do subtle ones on the master just to kind of control it. I don't think this track needs it. I like where it's at. I may change my mind when I'm listening not in headphones, but that's what we've got. I'm gonna bring this area up a little bit, just a little. Just a little bit. So the kick is very loud. It's quite prominent. We could lower the kick a little bit. I kind of need to hear that though on speakers, but sometimes it's nice to just have a really loud kick. I am gonna take the low end down a little bit. That's where you wanna go with EQ. You want to shape all of the frequencies that are combining because taking out mud, tweaking the high end a little bit, it all can give you some more space and it just allows everything to sound a little more clean. If there's a lot of mud, everything's kind of just buried in it. And so removing that a little bit gives you some more space. Next up, we're gonna add a compressor. And again, this is gonna just help bring the levels together. If you've got a loud kick, like it seems like I might, it will help shape everything. The loudest parts will get a little lower and the quieter parts will get a little louder. Now, when it comes to mastering, you don't wanna use a massive amount of compression. I'm looking for just about two dB of reduction this logic compressor has a nice meter here that will show you how much it's doing. So let's turn that on. So again, I just want about 2 dB and I want a slow attack and release. I don't want the compressor hitting very quickly. I want it to just kind of be there slowly and just get there. Also, always check auto gain. Again, every time you're adding something that adds gain, it's it will sound better, but that doesn't mean it's doing anything. And so you want to make sure that what it's doing is actually altering it a little bit. Let's do a massive amount of compression just so you can see. And I'm only doing a two one ratio. You don't want anything more than two, two one. I'm gonna do two zero. Uh, but this is a massive amount of compression. So see, every time that kick is hitting, it's, it's causing it. You can hear everything's kind of changing. Again, I just want a nice little 2 dB. Just kind of glue things together. If you're working in different genres, you may want more, you may want less. But I just want a little bit of gel here to just bring everything together. You can color sound with a compressor too. I highly recommend doing a lot of research on compression. If you want, go to ChatGPT or something and have it just run through, giving you an understanding of compression. There's amazing videos on YouTube you can check out as well, but compression can make or break a track, so you don't wanna mess around with it. But again, if you just focus on 2 dB of compression, a very low ratio, and slow attack and release, make sure the auto gain is off you're gonna get some nice compression on the overall sound, and it's gonna allow you to push it more when you add the final fifth piece of this mastering. We're just doing five. You can get a lot more complex, and I typically do, but again, I just wanna give you something simple that you can just throw on and do. But remember, all of this is variable based on your track. So just because 
My setting is negative 18 on the threshold. That doesn't mean yours will be. The two zero should be pretty stagnant. And then the attack and release, you wanna go again by the track. Whatever threshold is gonna get you that two dB of reduction, that's what you wanna go with. So the next one that I wanna talk about, there's actually two different ones to consider. So the first one is actually reverb. And you're probably thinking, reverb on a master, are you crazy? And maybe I am, but what I'm doing here with reverb is actually creating a space. And I say space in terms of a room. So I like a lot of those older recordings where you had guitar amps and real drums and things like that. They would either record them all together in a room and have room mics that were capturing the reverb sounds and sounds bouncing off the walls and stuff, and they'd have that really quietly, or they would have room mics for all these different things. They'd have a guitar amp with a mic close up and then a mic further back that was capturing the room sound. So I'm just trying to kind of replicate that in the digital space because everything I'm working with is straight into the computer. There's no amp simulation or anything like that, at least for some of these tracks. So by adding a, just a touch of reverb, and I like Space Designer. What I like about Space Designer is it's got IRs and things like that and spaces. So I just go for a small space and a room or indoor space. Just look around what they have. They usually have like a studio or something like that. And you just want a, a small one. You don't need a lot. So we'll just use recording room. So let's play just the wet. So yeah, it's chaos but let's just put it really low. This is it just raising it so you can hear it. I'm just putting it way back there. This is it without it. This is it with it. It's probably honestly imperceptible. You may not even be hearing the reverb anymore, but psychoacoustically it's there and it's just giving this subtle hint of being in the room, especially if you're listening on headphones or something like that, when you're listening on Spotify or, you know, vibing out in the car or at home or something, it just kind of gives you a sense that you're in there with the musicians. Me personally, I just like it. But the other thing you can do, if you don't like the sound of that, is go to a stereo spread. Now, when I work with the Dallas setup, I typically am trying to just get ideas out and don't do a ton of panning. So everything's kind of mono and right down the center. But if you do it just a light high frequency spread or something like that, just to add a little bit of room and we'll we'll take a look actually with the multimeter. So this is it without it. And if we go to this meter, we can see it's pretty straight down the center. I do have pads set left and right, but it's not doing much. So let's add this one. Now look, it's a little wider and this is a very narrow track, but I don't mind. Let's do this one. I hate the sound of that. It moved it around a little too much. And you can do your own custom ones. Let's do the medium, actually. So here, how everything, if you're listening on headphones or something, you'll hear it's kind of the hi-hats have now spread around. I'm not saying you need to do this and you don't have to do it in such high amounts. I like to just have a little bit there, just a bit that's just opening up the sound a little bit. So again, let's hear it without. Look at that meter, it's straight down the center. We add this, we just get a little more width and you can hear it, it's there with the ears. Now, one thing to consider if you're using stereo widening, especially on the master, is correlation. If you start getting that correlation or uh, phase going out of phase because of the stereo spread you're doing and things like that. It can cause issues when somebody's listening on mono speakers and I don't even know if phones are mono anymore, but phones used to be mono, things like that. Uh, but it's just something to keep in mind because if you wanna make sure something sounds good on every type of listening device, you definitely don't want phase issues and phase issues can be an issue on anything really, but it's especially a problem when you run in mono. So you could test the final track in mono to see what's happening, but just keep that in mind. Now the final bit that we're gonna do is the thing that will really bring everything together. It brings the volume up and that's adding a limiter. I typically use a waves limiter, but that's paid for. And so we're going to use something that comes stock with logic. So we'll use the adaptive limiter and I'm going to put that on. And then now what you want to do is you're just going to, it's another thing where you're controlling the peak, but you set a ceiling. You don't want things going over. If something goes to zero or above zero, you're going to get some really nasty digital clipping. You want to avoid that at all costs. And something to consider as well is um, streaming, if you're planning to put your music on streaming, will typically convert your tracks to lower resolution MP3s or something like that. So you always want to work in a lossless quality, right? You know, 24-bit, all that kind of good stuff. But it will typically convert down to MP3 and things like that. And when it does that, sometimes 
the volume gets a little raised. And so if you're working with a ceiling of negative three or negative one, sometimes when it gets converted by the streaming platforms, it will clip. So I like to work more in the negative five or negative one. That's what I find works, but this is variable. See what works for you. If you put songs on streaming and don't have an issue with this, then it's all good. So basically what I wanna do is this is it without the limiter on. Now we're bringing the limiter up and you're seeing the reduction. When those peaks hit, it's bringing it down negative two and all that stuff. And now we brought, I think it was what? Negative 18 and when we turn this on, we're getting the luffs up to like negative 14. We can just keep driving this. Spotify likes negative 14 luffs, but it's really variable and it also depends on the duration of those luffs. So if you're hitting really high peaks for a long time, you may wanna be at negative 14, but go with what you feel comfortable with. These things are always changing and I don't wanna cater my music to the streaming service. If people wanna buy the highest quality, it's on Bandcamp, it's on my website, but streaming's already dropping the quality down. So whether it's gonna change my volume a little bit, I don't really care. So I'm gonna go for what I like. So we're talking peak at the peak, which is the loudest part of this song, I wanna go for negative 12 or negative 11 luffs and we're gonna hit negative 0.5. That's what we set the limiter to for the ceiling for the peak. Because if we go to a different part, now we're at negative 16. So we're preserving dynamics. The song still has soft and loud parts. And so things will still have dynamic to the ear. You could brick wall the thing that's not what we're doing. Let's shut everything off. And again, we are doing massive amounts of gain, so it will sound different, but this is it off. Okay, I'm gonna keep the meter on just so you can see how much gain it's adding and what it's doing. Now let's add gold clip. The kick low end has changed a little bit. The high end has changed a little bit. Add the EQ. These are a little more subtle, but now we've toned out some of the mud and things like that. Add the compressor, get a little pump, because that's what we want with this four on the floor, but also just glue everything together. Peaks are changing a little bit. Let's add the spread. Look at that. It's really changed the width of this track. And now the final bit, just prep your ears. If you use these five plugins though, this is a quick way to just get your track much louder and have a lot more punch to it and get it up there with those other songs you hear on streaming platforms and things like that. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you got some value out of it, give it a like, subscribe if you haven't already. And that's my workflow for finishing beats. It's really just about getting past that perfectionism of trying to tweak every single aspect of a song. And that's why despite its shortcomings, I kind of like having the main emphasis of the track or main bulk of the track being a stereo two track from the Dallas setup. I, if I had the chance, would have gone back, adjusted the drums, changed the hi-hats, taken out some parts and things like that, but I couldn't. I couldn't go in and change individual parts. You're set with it and you can just kind of keep going from there. And, and I need that as someone who's often perfectionist with music releases and things like that. This works really well for me. But one thing you wanna keep in mind when you're doing consistent monthly releases is making sure that every song sounds different. You don't want every song to sound exactly the same. So check out this video next to see how I do it. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.